Thanks, everyone. It's my pleasure to now introduce uh, Donny Zucone, Zucone, my apologies, uh, President and CEO of the Economic Club of Chicago, and Bill McNabb, former Chairman and CEO of Vanguard. Donna is President and CEO of the Economic Club of Chicago. Founded in 1927, the Economic Club is one of the nation's most influential forums for disseminating economic business and social news. It's dedicated to the fostering development of leaders within Chicago's civic and business community. That economic club has welcomed many prominent thought leaders as speakers, including CEOs of leading Fortune 500 companies, US presidents, prime ministers, and other foreign dignitaries. Speakers include Bono, Yo-Yo Ma, Larry Fink, Barack Obama, Jerry Diamond, some of my close friends. Um, before her leadership role at the economic club, Ms. Sarconi also served as the president of Harley-Davidson Financial Services, where she led the international company through transformational growth. In her eight-year tenure as president, managed loans grew from $1.1 billion to over $6 billion. Market share soared from 20% to 50, and operating income increased from $20 million to over $200 million. She currently serves on three corporate boards, Cigna, CD, CDW, and the the coaches group. Her leadership has been instrumental to today's event, and we are very pleased to have her in the company. Uh, it's my also, also my ple pleasure to introduce Bill McNabb, former chairman and executive CEO of Vanguard. He joined Vanguard in 1986. In 2008, became the CEO. In 2010, became the chairman of the board of directors and board of trustees. He stepped down in 2017 and as chairman at the end of 2018. During his tenure as Vanguard CEO from 2008 to 2018, assets under management grew almost five-fold. Bill is a board member of United Healthcare Group, the chairman of Ernst & Young's Independent Audit Committee. He's also chairman of the board of Zoological Society of Philadelphia. He's also a key board member of CCP, Chief Executives for Corporate Purposes, and a board member of the Philadelphia School Partnership. We are very fortunate and grateful to have Bill on, also as the co-chair of SII's advisory board and serving on our board, where he demonstrates compassion, conviction, integrity, and thoughtfulness. He's playing an indispensable role in help, helping, helping SII scale so it can sail and is enabling us to move minds so we can move markets to support long-term value creation. What I also learned about Bill, and I'll wrap up here, is that his spirit animal is the rhino. So, which like Bill, is endearing, enduring, formidable, and awe-inspiring. With that, please, me, please join me in welcoming Don and Bill. Thank you, Mark. The spirit animal is the rhino, so we should stay out of your way. <laughs> you know, Tony the rhino is, one, is a, uh, he's an endangered white rhino who uh, has been part of the Philly Zoo for probably 25 years now, and he and I have just bonded. I don't know if it was the sugar cane I snuck him or whatever, but uh, yeah, he is my spirit animal. That's great. So, um, so let's start with uh, 5x increase in assets under management. Um, and a decade in a leadership role. Um, can you talk about what were the biggest shifts you saw during that time and in the, what's happened in the whole investment in capital markets? Yeah, um, so you know, one of the, either my great fortune or misfortune in some ways, but I think it was actually, it was actually a lot of luck, which you'll, you'll hear more about, but um, I became CEO two weeks before Lehman Brothers. So we, we joke inside of Vanguard, we don't believe in market timing, but my <laughs> predecessor sure had a really good sense. Um, so, uh, but don't pay attention to my recommendations on the markets. Um, so, y you know, this, obviously the GFC for me was the single biggest set of changes, um, you know, during uh, the last decade. And, you know, we're still feeling the repercussions. I think many of the political tensions that we still see uh, in existence emanate from uh, that crisis, you know, because it really was the first time in a sense that the financial system led 
the broader economy into distress. Usually it's the other way around. Usually there's economic weakness that then gets translated over into the financial system and then there's weakness there. But this was a, a real failure of the financial system. So, you know, from a shift standpoint, we saw a huge distrust of the financial sector. Um, we saw unprecedented regulation, um, you know, Dodd-Frank and all the other subsequent legislation. Um, the biggest rewriting of the financial uh, legal infrastructure um, since the Great Depression. And then um, there was also a lot of competitive dynamics uh, that changed as well, as well. So for me, that was by far and away the biggest shift. Um, I, I'd say the second thing that happened, and you know, we at Vanguard, we've certainly benefited from this. We would like to think we were also a catalyst for it. Um, price competition has actually really come to money management. Um, and you know, now, uh, you know, I, I turn on the TV and my kids tease me because some of our competitors are running ads on television that, oh, our funds are cheaper than Vanguard's or whatever. And the fact that somebody can actually do that and actually thinks it's a good idea to do that, um, that would not have occurred 20 years ago uh, or even, you know, 10 years ago. And I think this, again, um, this price competition, uh, our founder, Jack Bogle, whom we lost in January, um, had been talking about it since the late 70s but it had really never occurred. And you know, we were out there chirping about price being really important and everybody kind of nodded. And during the great bull market of the 80s and 90s, didn't, it, it really didn't matter from a commercial standpoint. We thought it mattered from an investor standpoint. Um, but we now in the last decade, and so you're seeing tremendous price pressure and tremendous disruption in the money management business as a result of it. I will tell you also, some of it's due to a, a business model change that most outsiders overlook. And that business model change is how advice and distribution occur in investment management. It used to be that 80% of the people went to their local broker and got a recommendation regarding which, what's the best performing fund and you know, what are the two or three best performing funds and build a portfolio for me around that idea and the brokers were compensated through commissions. So it was a transactional thing, just like buying individual stocks. What we've seen um, in the last decade is a tremendous shift to asset-based fees and brokerage firms converting their model into much more of an advisory model. And so they're actually acting like the independent advisors who have been doing this for quite some time. And this is now the dominant form of how funds and investment product overall gets both distributed and managed uh, for individuals. You know, there's still a self, you know, do it yourself or we certainly um, have a huge clientele there. But again, 75% of the business is really run through advisors and, and either independent advisors or the big wirehouses and so forth. And them getting paid for asset-based as opposed to transactional put tremendous pressure on the product price because the way to maintain a reasonable margin on the advice piece was to drive down the cost of the product so that the overall cost came down for the investor. Um, I don't think people recognize how profound that is and that we're, the product side is, you know, there's not a lot of room to go, but on the advice side, and we'll get to this, yeah. um, I, I think that's actually an area where you're going to see continued pressure uh, going forward. And then I'd say the third thing um, that it, it may interest this group um, more than most, um, the third profound change for me is um, the whole beginning, uh, this probably started about five years ago, a couple of articles in Harvard Business Review, challenging the primacy of total shareholder return as the sole measure of a company's success. And now as an investor, you know, we believe in total shareholder return. We have a fiduciary obligation to seek it for our investors. But you began to see lots of tension around what about other stakeholders and so forth. Um, there are a number of people in the room here who've actually spoken out on this. And I think that's actually been one of the catalysts for the refocus, if you will, on governance. And again, I would say we're in early innings on the governance front, um, you know, that evolution. but. It, to me, it, it's again, it's a pretty profound mm -hmm. change. Um, it, it, I'll, I'll tell you one just anecdotal story, um, and, and I know, you know Don and I had a chance to chat ahead of time, so I, I know there are things that are on her mind. Mm -hmm. um, 
when we went and started talking about governance to active investors, and, and, and again, people think of Vanguard as this you know, index monolith, and we are a huge indexing shop, but we also run one of the largest active equity um, businesses in the, in the world, and we, unlike most firms, we don't do it all at Vanguard. We actually have sub-advisors all around the world, so we have 31 firms who run our active funds for us. So we went to all of them and said, hey, you know, how do you guys think about governance and in, as part of your investment process? And the answer was not interested, okay, mm -hmm. not interested. And today when you go and talk to those firms, it's wholly integrated into their investment process. It's been a profound change. And, and again, not one that's out there being talked about a lot, but I actually think it's gonna, it, it is changing the way people think about man investment management. Yeah, I think so. There's a, quite a lot to unpack there, but let me, uh, let me, let me focus on the last discussion more uh, around governance, mm -hmm. because I think that's a, an area that uh, is, is changing very rapidly. Um, no question we're going to continue to see price pressure on the product, and certainly I think price pressure on the asset manager, so I'd like to hear a little bit more on that too. But on the governance piece, um, I've heard you comment that Vanguard is the ultimate long-term investor. Uh, and for, um, for a, quite a few years, a passive investor, not only in, in, the, in the style, but also in the interaction on governance. But I think uh, what we're seeing now, particularly what I'm seeing from the board level, is that you're becoming much more active, not only you, but other institutional mm -hmm. investors, with regards to ESG issues, whether it's climate change, diversity, inclusion, or even a clearly articulated long-term strategic plan, which we've been discussing here. What's changed? Yeah, so um, I think to, to understand what's changed, um, you have to sort of go back to um, a couple of, I'll call them catalytic events for us. And, you know, it was really in the mid-2000s um, when the, this generation of activist investors began to really become more prominent. Mm -hmm. You know, we'd gone through the green male version of activism in the late 90s, and we'd experienced that as a firm, and then that kind of cadre of investors died away for a bit. But, you know, 2004, five, uh, even 2006, we began to see a, a real push by a number of firms. And in, in, in the early days, I would say 80% of it was very focused on short-term results. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you saw lots of pressure for companies to do things that would clearly boost the stock price in the short run but perhaps, again, I say perhaps, in the long run, create a situation that wasn't sustainable for the company and maybe wasn't even good for the company's long-term health. I think you lived through some of this yourself, um, probably at Harley, seeing mm -hmm. some of those tensions, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, frankly, as a large shareholder, and we are permanent on the index side. You know, if you look at our index holdings, you can't sell something when you don't like what's going on. So. You, you have to match the benchmark. So you are a permanent shareholder. And we began really questioning whether or not some of these short-term actions were in the long-term best interest of our clientele, mm -hmm. who tend to also hold the money at Vanguard for a very long time. Our average client tenure is about, in a, in a standard index mutual funds, about 12 years. So, and again, you can think there's probably a, a, a small percentage of short-term and actually there's quite a few who are hit there much longer. So that gave us the perspective that we needed to maybe do things differently. And you know, my predecessor, Jack Brennan, um, wrote you know, really what was the first letter you know, to our portfolio companies, kind of outlining you know, our principles and what we believed in, and long-termism was sort of central to that. I'm looking at Chris Whiteman, who's here, who was with us at the time, and his colleague, Glenn Borum, who's still at Vanguard, they were you know, very active voices inside the firm saying, maybe we need to rethink this. And that was really what drove it. And um, since, it's, you know, since we've begun, you know, began the effort, um, what we found was um, the debate was pretty, you know, was pretty rigorous. Mm -hmm. um, the early days, we focused a lot on engagement and you know, how do boards, in a sense, govern long-term strategy and long-term plans for their, for their management, you know, for the uh, companies in which they serve. And then, you know, as some of the um, broader uh, environmental and social issues began to, to weave their way in, um, I would say our, our interest there was actually twofold. 
One, it was, I, I will say, a genuine curiosity as to how do those factors impact long-term performance. And then there was also the, uh, I would call it the hard reality, you know, sort of uh, just experience that some of those issues were becoming highly politicized. And again, how do we think about that in terms of what our fiduciary responsibilities are for our, our clients who are there to, you know, earn a long-term, you know, have long-term wealth creation. And so all of this sort of conspired, Donna, to, mm -hmm. to really focus us on this. And so, you know, we went from a team of two or three people to a team of 30 plus people and growing globally. Um, you know, our letters, um, you know, that we send out um, on a regular basis, get a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. We get great engagement from boards, um, you know, and, and we have a chance to interact. Um, again, a number of companies uh, who've been represented these forums, we've had tremendous interactions over, over time with them. And I think it's, you know, helping, you know, in a sense, um, create a better structure, if you will, for governance. So I think uh, what, I, what I'm paraphrasing what, you, what you're saying there is that um, you learn from the activists playbook. You realize that um, oftentimes you're one of the largest shareholders in, um, when you look at the proxy filings. Uh, and that you're using your clout and your voice in a much more proactive way. Uh, but, but there was a point in time where uh, the Office of the Corporate Secretary would routinely reach out to institutional investors and say, um, do you have any questions or things you want to talk to us about? And the answer would come back, no. Is that, is that game changing? And, um, yeah, that, and th that's where do you see it going? Yeah, that's changed a lot. You know, um, one, there's much more, um, I would say two things. One, corp the Office of the Corporate Secretary is, is, is not only asking the, that question, mm -hmm. the best ones are actually proactively saying, we actually think you need to know this and you need to engage with us around this. And so there's much more proaction on that in that regard. I think it's a really good thing because the last thing you want to do is be looking across at independent directors in a proxy fight. And you know, pr proxy fights get all the attention, but they you know tend to be 30 to 50 a year. Or so in the in the, in the but they consume a lot of time. But you want to know the boards um, before that, and you want to know how they think and you know what their processes are and so forth, so that you have at least uh, a working knowledge. And I do think. Um, you know, again, one of the reasons we're so interested in, in the strategic investor initiative here at CECP is it just fosters, you know, in a sense, boardroom thinking around long-term strategy, mm -hmm. perhaps engagement. Again, we're not interested as an index provider. You know, the fabulous presentation we just saw from, you know, PS, uh, ENG, I, you know, our guys aren't going to tell you whether or not that's the right winning strategy for a utility. But what our people are going to be really interested in is how does the board think about that? How does the board govern that? How, what kind of processes are in place? How does the board get competitive information? How does the board react to uh, regulatory changes and so forth um, in terms of the governance model? So there's a, you know, that's a difference between, say, how we are going to approach it and you know, a value act who you know, is in that activist school but is a very long-term player, they're gonna be deep on the strategy. Yep. And um, you know, almost taking a more of a private equity kind of perspective, if you will, that they'd rather be you know, in helping management. So th there's a difference there. And so now you're, uh, you've jumped to the other yeah. side and you are the board. Um, uh, so in that role, uh, how do you, s what have you learned and, uh, and what, what are you, what, what different conversations are you having in the boardroom? Yeah, so um, I, I serve on a number of, um, you know, nonprofit boards, but my first public board is um, United Health, Health. and, uh, you know, big, sprawling, 250,000 employees, 250 billion in revenue. Um, so the good news for me has been um, being part of that board has just reinforced um, what I think good governance looks like, because I actually see it in practice. Um, I think um, the, the, the board of directors there is absolutely superb in terms of thinking about governance from a best practices standpoint. And so that's been a really good thing for me. Like, and, and 
in a sense, I could go from the investor perspective where we believed all these things would actually make for better run companies, yeah. but actually being inside and seeing them in practice. And, 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 and again, in United's case, they've been in practice for quite some time. So it wasn't me coming in saying, oh, I've got all these ideas. Um, and frankly, they were doing unbelievably pro, you know, sort of cutting edge things as a board. Again, just a practical example um, so people can get a sense of what I'm talking mm -hmm. about. Uh, United had a, an advisory group of investors that interacted with the nominal governance chair on a regular basis. So as, as they were thinking about board composition looking forward, mm -hmm. they would literally go to that advisory group and say, hey, how do you, how, you know, here's the kinds of things we're thinking about from a skill set. What do you see? What do you hear? What do you think competitors are doing, et cetera, et cetera? And you know, it's it's led I think us to some pretty interesting choices in terms of you know refreshing the board and whatnot. So again, to me, um, you know, just a really cool best practice. Our our, our board, our, our head of non governance, Michelle Hooper, um, uh, has who's been great, thinking, by the way. yeah, who's <laughs> great and you know, well known in the Chicago mm -hmm. circle has been you know really, uh, again, very cutting edge about this. You know, the amount of time the United Board spends on strategy and risk is extraordinary. You know, one of the challenges that we all have in public companies um, is there's so much regulatory and administrative things that you're required to do. How do you get that stuff done efficiently mm -hmm. so that you can actually spend your time doing, in a sense, what you're there to do, which is help govern the company? And they have done a masterful job from a scheduling standpoint, making sure that we have sufficient time to really dig into strategic issues and risk issues. And again, the board's not setting strategy, but the board is responding and providing input as the management team thinks through their long-term plans. And it's, mm -hmm. it's again, um, pretty remarkable to watch. Um, I was talking to a couple of folks um, during coffee break who were at our investors day in November and you know, it's kind of a legendary investor day at this point where our CFO laid out a 10-year plan and was talking about the 10-year plan. You know, imagine being here in 2028 was sort of the opening line. And everybody was sort of blown away that, you know, this tremendous, this company with a great track record, by the way, of delivering very consistent results in, in the short run was also marrying that up with tremendous long-term vision. So it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long winded way of saying it, it, a lot of what I believe, believed from a governance standpoint, I actually see there and actually see that it works. So I, I feel really good about that. Yeah, let me, let me go in a little bit more to that because um, as a healthcare company that, that United Health is, um, I just wanna bridge over to Edelman's 2019 trust barometer, which I know Edelman, Richard Edelman's involved. Um, and, uh, I was at one of his presentations recently where he talked about uh, the high expectations from employees that their employers will join them uh, on taking action on societal issues. So this really goes to the discussion we were having earlier around stakeholders versus yep. just shareholders. Um, Milton Friedman, you're in the University of Chicago area here. Um, do you think we'll see a day where the market is gonna expect corporations to have uh, an impact responsibility as much as the, the, financial, the delivery of financial returns? So what, what I would say is, I think again, and, and I have a bias on this, Donna, mm -hmm. but I, I think people are actually not looking at this correctly in trying to separate them. I actually think they're inextricably linked. And you know, from my perspective, um, if you wanna create long-term value, then other stakeholder groups actually really matter. You know, if you're a lousy employer, eventually that catches up with you. And, you know, your product, your people become less than competitive, then your products and services begin to decline. And you can have the most brilliant leader who can maybe get you through a period there, but eventually that catches up with you, especially as you get bigger. And so I think the two are very inextricably linked, you know, and, and, and again, not to talk Vanguard's book too much, but you know, we're not a publicly um, uh, owned company. We're owned by our investors, if you will, we're a mutual. We had four metrics that we measured. 
okay, four metrics that we thought about for 10 years. And two of them were, would be what I would call sort of classic financial metrics that you would expect. So one was our fund performance versus benchmarks and competitors. The other was our expense ratio, you know, what do we charge? Because that's in a sense the inverse mm -hmm. of profitability, but for us that was how we measured profitability as a mutual. So the lower we could take the expense ratio in a sense, the more successful we were. So we had aspirations on those two fronts and we laid them out for 10 years. Interesting though, the other two numbers that we spent equal amount of time with our board and our internally our 17,000 people were the net promoter score, which is mm -hmm. a client loyalty measure, mm -hmm. and employee engagement. And, and through a very rigorous process. And so you had sort of what I would call two non-GAAP metrics married with two GAAP metrics. And people would say, oh, wait a minute, that feels kind of touchy-feely. We believe very strongly that if we created a great place to work, that would translate into better service for our, our clients. And we would see that reflected in client loyalty. And we actually did. Mm -hmm. um, and we can, we could, I could go, I could spend a whole day on this um, if you're interested. So we went, you know, for us, those were, were really, really powerful. And then you marry that up with, you know, doing a, doing a good job on the investment side, which is our product, if you will, that we manufactured. Um, that to us was the key to success. I actually think for every company, there's the equivalent of those metrics. Again, I'll come back to United um, because you know I, I'm on its board, but you know net promoter score is a really, really critical metric. Um, mm -hmm. Again, those of you who were at the investor day there know that it was front and center in every business. And so to me, um, many of these issues that we talk about um, in, in broad term of sustainability link to long term you know, linked to this long-term concept. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what we're trying to drive in, you know, the strategic in, uh, investor initiative here. You know, if you look at the seven questions that we mm -hmm. laid out, you know, for uh, CEOs to answer, they actually kind of lead you to that, right? They you do. know, the first one is all around, what's your core purpose? You know, why mm -hmm. do you exist? Which is, what's mm -hmm. your, you know, it's not what, what are you trying to accomplish? It's, it's really more existential than that. Why do you exist? And mm -hmm. I think that's actually a really important question. Mm -hmm. And then there's, you know, talent, strategy, risk are all kind of encompassed mm -hmm. in, those other, in, in, in those other questions. And to me, that's kind of how it breaks down. Um, and, you know, to be really good on the talent and culture side, you actually have to be very um, cognizant of you know your customers, your community. You know, it's interesting. One of the most popular things um, I did um, as CEO at Vanguard, I was giving a talk actually to a Philadelphia convention uh, on venture capital, and they wanted to know sort of how we thought about you know the people side of the equation, and we boiled it down to we think we got to take care of three constituents, our clients, our crew, and our communities, and the three C's as we called it. And the interaction of those was really powerful. Um, now I didn't have a fourth, which was outside shareholders. Um, so, mm -hmm. um, because our clients were our owners, but for th that resonated with our people so much because it, again, it explained why we believed in being engaged in our communities. Yeah. You know, it was, it was part of the deal. And giving back. So, all right, so I'm um, mindful that we probably have questions in the audience. Do we have, any, and I know we've got one coming in online. So any questions first in the audience? We're gonna go to the one online, which is how can institutional investors be successful engaging, pub, uh, engaging publicly traded companies? And, uh, and what's your take on the shareholder proposal process? Yeah, so um, I think the shareholder proposal process probably needs some refinement. Um, you know, it's, you know, we're walking, a, we're walking a balancing act here of trying to make, you don't want to make it so difficult that people can't put proposals forward, um, you know, because that'll stifle, you know, innovation. And it'll, it'll also stifle, you know, input. At the same time, you don't want the same proposals that are defeated every year, 95-5, coming back over and over and over again, right? So, you know, it's, um, that, that's where I think there's still some room uh, possibly for improvement. You know, in terms of investors successfully engaging uh, publicly traded companies, um, I think, 
you know, it's, it's really good to, for investors to come in when they talk to um, boards to really know kind of what, what do they want out of the meeting? Um, you know, what does, as an investor, what do you want to convey? Um, a lot of times it's looked at as a one-way dialogue. And, you know, so especially for like an active manager, um, what independent directors really want, they want your views on what's going on in the, in the marketplace competitively. How does our leadership team stack up against its peers? You know, what do you think about our long-term strategy as it has been articulated, if it's been mm -hmm. articulated? Mm -hmm. um, they actually want that input from outside investors. Um, I agree, and I also, uh, having been on these phone calls, would say, uh, if you're supporting a proposal or opposing a proposal, why or why? What's the issues behind it and more of the color in terms of the, of the thought process? Uh, it's very helpful, very instructive. Yeah, and for you know, if, if um, you know, and you know, for you know, those of us who are um, less active, you know, either you know, in a pure index or a factor-based, um, you know, kind of investor, there again, I think what boards want to hear is how do you think about the gov your own governance principles mm -hmm. and how are you going to apply them so that there are no surprises. Um, I think that's a very important um, uh, uh, requirement from an engagement standpoint, so that you get a dialogue going. Yeah. So, uh, so what, are there some hot buttons right now from uh, from Vanguard that are key corporate governance issues that you'd like to see changed? Well, I think you know one of the things we 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 spent a lot of time the last few years broadly on board composition. And that continues to evolve. So when we started out on board composition, the broad thing was, hey, you need a diverse set of experiences and a diverse set of um, uh, a diverse set of experiences and a diverse mindset, if you will. And, and you should be looking not only at traditional measures of diversity because you will get you need to, but you should also be thinking from an experiential um, and skill set standpoint. And you know, as that those discussions unfolded over a couple of years, um, especially on the gender question, there just wasn't that much progress. Yeah. And so, you know, we we became a signatory to the 30% Club, yep. um, which was uh, led by uh, the chairman of Bloomberg, Peter Grauberg, um, who really wanted, um, you know, put a stake in the ground that by you know X date. 30% of major company boards, and this was at the very large end of the market, 30% of those boards needed to be female. And, you know, the pushback that you get in, you know, just is, is always, well, gee, quota systems don't work, and, you know, that kind of top-down approach leads to bad things. But, you know, our response to that was um, having had lots of thoughtful dialogue for a number of years on this, nothing was happening. The data, it was just flat. And so since the 30% club has been enacted and since people have actually begun talking about it, you actually see the number of women going up on boards. And guess what? The early academic research says boards that are more diverse by gender actually perform better. Um, you know, it, it's not rocket science in a sense. So board composition, gender was really important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this year um, we, we came out with um, a focus on overboarding because there are no, you know, there are directors serving on, you know, ten boards, and, you know, can you really do a good job if if you're on that many boards? I think the role of an independent director today for a large publicly traded company has never been more demanding, and it's not go to four to six meetings a year and spend two and a half days, okay. um, you know, and maybe a day on each end prepping or whatever. It's a it's a full time job if so, you're doing so it right. So overboarding. With the so overboarding for you know so what? we we laid out criteria it was five public boards or if you were a sitting CEO more than one outside board, and again I think there will be nuances to this and you know you could dream up situations where you might say well you know that's not really that's not really being overboarded you know a company splitting for example and mm -hmm. having the same CEO um, or, or the former CEO sit on both boards is that really an overboarding or not. 
I think those things as we get to the practical implications will be discussion points. But I think it's pretty hard to argue that, you know, being on five publicly traded boards, because most people, by the way, who are on publicly traded boards are also doing a couple of nonprofits and a couple of private. So, you know, imagine you've got four publicly traded boards, you've got three nonprofits, you've got two private, all of a sudden you've got 10 boards. Um, can you devote the kind of time and energy that you need to? Yeah. Especially in, in some of the, you know, with the sectors and the amount of disruption going on in so many economic sectors today. Yeah, and the amount of time. That, that, uh, yeah. Uh, I think that was also interesting is that uh, board, there's a perception that, that the board meets four times a year, five times a year, six times a year. Well, that's, that if everything is going smoothly, but it doesn't always happen that way if there's transactions going on or other, uh, other issues that are coming yep. up. So having the ability and the time. Can I see if there's any questions? Do we have one in the audience? We have one right there. Could you tell us your name and your company, please? Thank you. Tim Yeomans, Hermes VOS. Uh, thank you, Bill. Um, under your leadership at Vanguard, uh, you grew the stewardship function tremendously to be one of the biggest teams in the world. Uh, Herm we at Hermes US have a big stewardship team as well. Great leadership, Glenn Borum, uh, uh, Rob Main, Adrian Monley on the team. And you, I know you had a lot of interaction with them, but now you're on the other side as a corporate director. Their job uh, was and is to talk to directors, as is ours at Hermes, uh, but now you're on the other side. What have you learned that is new now that you're a corporate director as opposed to uh, being the leader that built a big stewardship team. Yeah, you know, um, thank, thanks. There's no easy answer to that. I'm still processing, to, you know, to be, to be fair. But um, look, I think that, you know, one of the big takeaways for me is um, actually just how complicated being a director is today. Um, you know, I think I had an appreciation for that. But, you know, the Vanguard board, which I'd been on, you know, for a long time, was you know pretty well-oiled machine and so you know I, you, you kind of extrapolate what you see i'm blown away by the complexity um, of all the things you know managing the committees managing um, the ongoing board education you know just as a director all the things i need to do just to stay current uh, with what's going on in healthcare, uh, which was not my natural mm -hmm. sector so um, the, I, I would say that's been a real eye opener for me. And you know, one of the things I think from a governance standpoint that we're all gonna have to sort of manage um, as being big proponents of better governance is we don't wanna make it so burdensome that nobody wants to be a director and everybody wants to go private. I actually, that's a whole nother It's a whole topic, nother discussion. That a whole we, nother discussion we did have a, you know, Don and I had. There's you know, huge shrinkage in the number of public companies, as you all know, and it's really beginning to impact not just the micro, you know, micro cap sector, but actually you're seeing it in mid market and even some larger uh, companies now. And I don't think that's a good thing. So, um, you know, from a, you know, if I were king for a day, I guess, you know, what I'd love to see is the, bur the regulatory burdens be appropriate for directors, but directors need to spend time on the real strategic issues. And you know, to me, the strategic issues revolve around this long-term, you, know, you know, marrying up the long-term and the short-term. It's not an either or, by the way, it's an and. Talent, which is incredible. Um, you know, again, if you look at where there've been a lot of corporate failures, culture tends to you know, be there and talent is part of that. So how do directors do a better job there? Um, and then obviously the, the risks are just compounding. And so you know, how you think about that uh, strategically as a board. So to me, you know, that's been the big aha is, you know, I thought it was hard before, but it's really hard. And um, I could do nothing but read analyst reports and commentary and stuff out of Washington on healthcare. I could, I, I could literally make it a very, very full day just doing that. And, and, that, and it's important that I do. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are out of time. And, uh, but I think that's a, a, a really great wrap up in terms of making sure that we're thinking about the balance between long-term and short-term. And thank you for spending the time with us Donna, today. thank you very much. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Bill. That was great. We're gonna do another poll right now. So. If
folks can go to slido.co and we'll, we're going to do a poll. Will hearing companies' long-term plans influence your proxy voting and engagement strategies? In Tim Yeomans, you can only vote once. So. Again, it's slido.com, pound CIF7. Those are encouraging uh, results. So strongly agree that these long-term plans are Important, impactful, and 42% and agree. So we have, uh, that, that is a very good chart, and we're pleased to see that. So with that, I, I would like to um, introduce the next two panelists for uh, Fireside Chat, Dan Nielsen and Eileen Gordon. Dan is the Managing Director and Senior Portfolio Specialist at Great Lakes Advisors, where he is an integral part of the firm's investment teams, and involved in new product development. Dan is also the person who asks, always asks us the tough questions, too, so we're grateful for that. He serves on SAI's advisory board, and at, uh, he, he also oversees the firm's ESG integration and responsible investing initiatives, working to identify and incorporate material, environmental, social, and governance factor, factors into investment strategies to create socially responsible investment portfolios that align with client expectations. Dan, Dan is the inspiration behind today's event. We're grateful for his role and support of our initiative. We're delighted to have him supporting SAI's work in driving ESG adoption. Eileen Gordon is a true pioneer and first mover. And, in a remarkable person in, in many ways. She was the retired chairman, president, and CEO of Ingridgen, and, it, and she currently is the presiding director of International Paper and a director of Lockheed Martin. From 2009 to 2017, Ms. Gordon was chairman, president, and CEO of Ingridgen, a, a leading global producer of nature-based ingredient solutions for food, beverage, brewing, and industrial customers around the world. A Fortune 500 company, it has 11,000 employees in 2007, net sales of 5.8 billion. Ms. Gordon was the first female director of five different public companies. Arthur Gallagher and Company, United Stationaries, Outboard Marine Corporation, Sunstrad Corporation, and Zenith Technologies. She's also the vice chair of the conference board, a member of the MIT Corporation, the Institute's Board of Trustees, and on the executive committee of the Economic Club of Chicago. She's listed among Ford's global game changers and one of Fortune's power women for a number of years, five consecutive years with that. She became the 25th female CEO of a Fortune 500 company when the company sales reached six billion for the first time. And as of 2014, she was one of only two, 24 women who were CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. And as a side note, how many, how many women do you think are CEOs in 2018? That number is still the same. So there's only 24 women serving as CEOs for Fortune 500 companies which means we still have a lot of work to do. Eileen has never been afraid of standing up and standing out. At school, she advocated for taking shop lessons with the boys rather than being forced to take cooking classes. She prevailed then, and she's prevailed ever since. So please join me in welcoming Dan and Eileen to the stage. Great. Um, well, thank you for joining us. Okay, sure. So very excited to have you here. Um, focusing on 
long-term plans and a CEO's perspective. So um, I'd like to start off by you know, asking you to speak a little bit about how you balanced um, as CEO some of the long-term goals and plans you had with some of the shorter-term issues that came up and how did you maintain focus on the long-term plan? Sure, well, very happy to be here and uh, I've always been a big proponent of focusing on the long-term. So as an example, when I was CEO of Ingredion, we actually put a strategy together uh, and presented it to our board and then presented it to the street and we said we were going to grow the company in healthy ingredients and we were going to buy companies that were three to four hundred million dollars in sales. And the opportunity to buy National Starch came about, which was four times that. So we stuck to the long-term strategy of uh, building the company through M&A and healthy ingredients, but changed the, the playbook a little bit because it really increased value of the company uh, and it was a quicker way of doing that. It brought on a lot of people, great skill set, and over the next couple of years really got the company off and running towards the right trend. So um, let's talk a little bit about communication. So there's this balance between short-term and long-term and having a long-term plan, how did you find, were, what were the most effective means of communicating what the long-term plan was and the rationale behind yeah. that? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because now as a board member, I give advice to a lot of the CEOs that I sit on the board. And I always say to people, look, at if you, it's all about the long-term strategy. And if you have a great quarter, do not gloat because this isn't a quarterly business. And if you have a bad quarter, don't apologize. So that's my biggest piece of advice that I give them because it's all about making moves that build the value of the company. It might be investment in capital. It may be an R&D. It might be an M&A. But it's build and building the skill set of the people in the company. You have to have that perspective to have the long term to increase your total shareholder return. And often CEOs get caught up with uh, some of the short term, like, oh, gee, we had a great quarter. And, you know, the analysts don't help it. They congratulate you. And you're like, what you, well, thank you, okay. But you, it really isn't a quarterly business. So I think that if the CEO, the leadership, remembers that it's all about building long-term value, uh, they won't take any credit for the short term. So let's stick with this a little bit. Um, in the introduction that Mark provided, um, he mentioned several boards that you have or are currently serving on. Um, what are some other lessons that you learned as a CEO of a company that you've been able to put in place or help other CEOs with as your role as a director? Well, I think certainly uh, the management of, of messaging, um, whether it's with your employees or your customers mm -hmm. um, or investors is very important. So as an example, as a CEO, I always felt it was important to go out and meet with investors face to face. I used to call them non-deal road shows. I'd say, oh, I just did a road show. They'd say, oh, you have a deal going? I'm like, no, it's a non-deal road show. And it was very important to go out and meet um, every year, not just the CFO, but the CEO. And I would look at the, during the year and say, I want to touch the 20 top shareholders of the company. And so that's advice that I give to boards that I sit on. And it does take uh, a proactive nature to do that because you have to have schedules. Is it Boston? Is it New York? Is it San Francisco? Is it Denver? Is it LA? Um, even I remember doing a roadshow to Austin. Um, in Houston, and people said, thank you for coming. You know, we had <laughs> breakfast with some shareholders. Nobody's come to see me in 10 years. And I said, well, I want to understand, are we meeting expectations? You know, we're trying to build the strategy. Do you get it? Do you hear it? The other lesson that I learned is, you know, analysts, um, there are some that really dig in and understand the company. And I used to want to spend time with them. And every so often, there'd be an analyst who was on the cusp. The questions were not as good during the earnings calls. And people would say, well, he just doesn't get it. And I'd say, no, they're smart people. So as part of the road show, the non-deal road show, I actually would have analysts come along. And in between, sometimes they were invited into investor meetings, sometimes they're not. Like in Boston, they're not allowed to. Mm -hmm. Other places they are. And I would use the in-between time to talk about the strategy of the company to explain it. And it always paid off. So I think that you, as a CEO, you can't communication enough 
your strategy, your vision, how you want to make it happen, um, and to touch a lot of different people. So were there instances when you were meeting, particularly with some of your largest shareholders, where there was pushback on your long-term plan, your long-term vision or strategy, and how did you counter that? Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, when we were in the midst of looking at M&A, of course, because of Reg FD, you can't say something to somebody that you don't say to everybody else. So I remember a larger investor coming to see me, and they were trying to read the body language. Um, <laughs> is she going to make that acquisition, or is it going to be somebody else? Um, and I was with my CFO, and of course, we couldn't say anything. We, you know, he, when he said, well, are you going to buy this company? Of course, I would never answer that question. But I would talk about our strategy of building the company. So it was interesting how um, uh, later on when we made the acquisition and we did a deal roadshow. Um, this was uh, June 21st, 2010, right after we had announced the acquisition. I went to see that investor and he said, I never thought you'd do it. So he was reading my body language, but then it was all public. We could talk about it and why it made sense. And at that point, we were talking about, should we do it through debt or some equity? We ended up doing it all through debt, which was great um, and really built a lot of value. Um, but that was one of the subject matters of doing that. So. I think that sometimes you get um, investors that push back, um, like if you're doing a deal and they, d they really want you to do it through debt and not equity, they will mm -hmm. tell you their vote. You can debate it, but you can't really tell them what you're going to do, even if you know it. I mean, at that point, <laughs> I didn't really know it because of Reg FD. Right. So you have to be very careful about that, but, you, but engaging with smart people who care about the company is what it's all about. So I always enjoy smart people who really analyze it um, but sometimes uh, investors will, um, through some social contact, I remember visiting somebody who once said, well, gee, nothing's going to happen in South America for 10 years. And that was a big part of the company, 25% of the company. And I would debate it with them. And what the data was based on was really cocktail conversation or part of their family and not any kind of data on the industry per se. Hmm. So you have to pick your spots on where you debate it. So you've described yourself as a, a very analytical decision maker. Um, so I understand you enjoying speaking with the analysts. Um, but so what happens when the analytics or the, the facts that you see in front of you start to become misaligned with the long-term vision or what you mm. feel you, the company really should be doing? Well, you know, I love to tell the story about when Corn Products, the original name, bought National Starch. Uh, we announced it, and within 24 hours, I went with my entire team to meet with the National Starch team to make them feel like, you should stick with the company. There's a lot of value here. We value you. So when I walked into the room for dinner, the big joke was, what's the name of the new company? Corn Starch? You know, that was like a... But I was listening, and it wasn't so much that there was an obvious name, but the, it was clear that we needed a new name. And analytically, the corn products people said, we're $4 billion, it should be our name. And the national starch people, who were more focused on specialty rather than commodity, said, well, we're a billion three, so we like our name better. And so I said, time out, we're going to form an internal team of not just marketing people, but manufacturing, supply chain, and let's come up with a name that really depicts how we're going to grow the value of this company. And so we came up with Ingredion. We actually used our board as a focus group. Um, and it was one of the elements in terms of, is this a good name that will resonate? But here you'd say that the facts said, you know, go with the bigger company name. But it would have been a wrong message to everybody. And we wanted a new culture, uh, new keys to success. So the new name Ingredion really resonated with everybody once we went there. So. Um Thinking about the board, um, Bill McNabb just mentioned uh, some comments about the importance of governance and particularly long-term thinking. So as a CEO, um, how did you have those conversations with your board as far as long-term strategy? How did you share your vision and how did you solicit their input to help formulate mm -hmm. your plan? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm a big believer that you need a strategy discussion definitely every year and maybe every meeting. So as an example, at Ingredion, I made sure, we did this every September, that my team and I would present the strategic uh, focus to our board, and we'd engage in a discussion. 
So wouldn't, you don't want to just fill up 10 hours of time. You want to have time for discussion to get the input from the board. And we would get something different from every board member when you were talking about diverse perspectives. But, and we were on a five-year focus. Some companies are on a three-year focus. But I think it's very important to have this once a year, you're going to talk about strategy. And then I also was very disciplined that I didn't want to, talk, I didn't want to have anything happen during the year that wasn't mentioned in the strategy. That you, if you're really rigorous, you're thinking about things. And so during the year, I would feel it was my responsibility, and I look at my boards this way, that you want to have a continued strategy discussion in those other board members' meetings. So an example, we talked about it in September. Oh, and now it's December, and we're going in this direction. We're investing in this particular business. Remember how we talked about this at the strategy meeting. It's very important to link that. So I did that as a CEO, and I look to all my boards to make sure that that happens. Good. Um, can you talk a little bit about some changes that you've observed over the years as far as the communication of long-term plans versus short-term plans? You know, what trends have you observed? You know, I think that, uh, and I have been on boards for over 20 years when, when we were talking about the, being the first female on a number of boards. And I remember in the early days, pre-Sarbanes-Oxley, we talked about strategy, but it didn't, and we, we didn't talk about risk a lot. Um, and we talked about the numbers, the quarterly numbers. So I think the, the uh, quality of conversations have gotten um, much more important to the futures of the companies. And I think that the strategy is now a rigorous part of really every board that and some boards, you know, they go off site, we're gonna spend a weekend somewhere else, wh whatever uh, method people choose. But I think that's really important, whereas I don't think it was impor as important 20 years ago. Certainly diversity on the board was not very uh, important. I remember, as I said, being the first female in five different boards. In fact, I love to joke in walking into my first board um, and they said, oh, and your seat is over there. You know, Ralph died last week. You know, that, that's where we want you to sit. And, um, you know, the, the CEO of Zenith Electronics, Jerry Perlman, was very ahead of his time. He said, half of my customers are women, so I ought to have a female on my board. And I had a background, a very analytical background. He was sitting on the board of Stone Container. I was working at a competitor, so he could see some of the things that we were doing. So it all, it all worked out. So I'd say the, the diversity, not just in gender, but in terms of culture, and background um, uh, and ingredient. We had one of the most diverse boards. We were, we were operating in 40 countries. So we had four women, two Hispanics, one African American, because we needed the diversity of the thought and the experiences for the conversation to make the decisions. And I wanted a board that was very global. So I helped develop the board with the nominating governance committee. So as an example, I remember once we were talking about an investment in Colombia near Brazil. And I didn't want any board member to say, oh, I heard it's dangerous there, or, or Mexico. And I needed people who understood the nature of the product, the politics, uh, the government, and how you can uh, really affect value creation by investing in those, in those countries. And by having a very diverse board, we were able to do that. I remember putting on a board member who was from Colombia, but he lived in Panama City, and we had great conversations. He just was retiring from P&G. We had great conversations about the opportunities in South America and how we could take advantage of them, but it wasn't going to be easy. I took my whole board to Mexico, and not every single one was very excited to do that. And I remember we had to have a lot of security, um, which is expensive. But we, um, in Mexico, I remember um, this was, we were taking our board on a, a road trip maybe every other year, and I remember this trip we went to visit a new facility that was two hours outside of Mexico City. We had a dinner with customers from Mexico, very important. And we had a, different, a dinner with um, government people, um, some of the trade issues that were going on then. And so that was all very important. And the board was very excited to do that. So I think that um, there has been a lot more change um, in the expectations from boards than there were uh, 20 years ago. So in your opinion, what should um, long-term investors know about corporate boards to, to more effectively engage with them? Well, I think that uh, board members today, and I was listening to Bill, um, it's very important to stay current. 
So, um, you know, and that's why you don't want to overboard yourself. So when I say current, what does that mean? So I'm a newly retired CEO about a year ago. I left the board of Ingredion last August. But I continue to be part of what's called the Business Council, not the Business Roundtable, but Business Council, which is all about cybersecurity, uh, the consumer. I'm going to a meeting next week where the subject is on India and China. Um, and um, you keep yourself current. I went to the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. Hmm. From a board member's point of view, because what do I need to know as a board member to give um, good oversight, to have engage with the boards that I'm in? So it takes um, being very proactive to stay current, to be a good board member. And most boards that I've been involved with have been very open to engaging with board members' conversation. I've mentored some of the people at the company. Um, at International Paper, besides being presiding director, I'm head of the governance committee. Mm -hmm. At Lockheed Martin, I'm the new head of the compensation committee, all public information. Um, so it may, it's very important to keep yourself current so the, and so you should know, institutional investors, long-term investors should know that board members today, uh, are, they are self-disciplined uh, to be very current. And if they're not, their colleagues insist that they are. Who wants to sit in a boardroom with five people engaged and five people not engaged? So there's a little bit, I could use the word osmosis, that uh, the boards are very engaged now. And you walk out of a meeting and the management will say, that was a great meeting, we had good discussion, we made good decisions, and I can't wait till the next meeting. I mean, it used to be that they couldn't wait till, you know, let's get them on the airplane, let's get them out of here, <laughs> let's, um, let's not even give them lunch. Um, but today, I find that the boards that I'm involved in, um, they, they crave it, and so in between meetings, we have conversations maybe on the phone, with different management people, we may see them in, in different uh, particular subject matters. So it's a much more engaged conversation. Have you seen that, um, you know, I think we, one of the things you're touching on is diversity of experience and expertise and continual learning. Have you seen changes in the makeup of corporate boards over time to better reflect how many different issues can affect companies in the long term? For instance, cybersecurity, data security, that affects numerous companies out there, not just IT companies. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite tools that boards now use is called the skills matrix. You know, everybody's familiar with that. And we pull it out all the time from all my boards. And we use it at Ingredion because at every point in time, people self-score. Okay, what subjects do you feel comfortable? What are the key ingredients of skills for this particular board? But you can then see where you might have a hole or if somebody's retiring or leaving, where there might be um, a, a, a gap in the skill. And so I think it's important. A lot of people say, well, I, we really want a skill set in cybersecurity. Well, I always say, look, if you find a good board member who has skills beyond just cybersecurity, that's great, that fits with this and the dates and everything. But if not, you can always hire somebody to work for the company, a consultant, could give that expertise and the board would be happy to engage in a conversation. So it's, a, it's an important part of the board agenda and you may get it from another board member, but you may get it from management, you may get it from a consultant, just as long as you make sure that you're, in, you're engaged in it. Um, but it, the skills matrix, I think, continues to be one of the best tools that's ever been used by boards. Interesting, thanks for sharing that. Um, there's multiple stakeholder groups that had an interest in Ingredient and supplies to other companies as well. Can you talk a little bit about the differences in prioritizing short-term uh, perspectives and plans versus long-term plans amongst different stakeholder groups, be they suppliers, customers, certainly the investors, the employees? Well, certainly, um during my tenure of my nine years, it was very important to build value in the company. So to have the goals of management be aligned with those of shareholders. So that's why I loved hearing about total shareholder return, TSR, is a great measure. Um, and most companies um, have that as a long-term goal. So as a CEO, uh, I made sure that um, everything we did was building value for the company for the long term. So of course customers might have a short-term interest and you want to satisfy that. I remember having a couple of people call me up saying, gee, we need more of that product. You know, can we get it next week? Okay, that's pretty short term. But it would be all about the long-term relationship. Can we invest in R&D together? Um, 
are those companies open for that? So I actually, as a CEO, would meet with customers, meet with suppliers, and I like to meet with those that had the long-term perspective. So it wasn't just about you know, what, what's the price they got now or what delivery they got next week, but really about the long-term trends and how do you build value together. And that's why I got to meet a lot of other senior leaders at other companies. And I would bring along with me the operating head from Ingredion who was involved in that. It might be the head of procurement, it might be the head of North America, South America, but we would meet with those customers to talk about what is it going to take to build the long term. Hmm. So anybody with short termism, I, I really didn't uh, want to spend a lot of time. I, I, but I looked for it. I mean, they may say that, but then I would say, well, how do you think about your company long term? And they'd say, well, we're a biscuit company and it's all about um, healthy starches that we want to build, uh, gluten-free, non-GMO. So if you can help us think about that, we'd love that. And so we would engage with that. So I find most people are willing to think about the long term. So we've had a couple survey questions that Mark has asked us in the online audience um, about long-term plans. And it seems like some of the feedback is general consensus. There's not enough um, long-term plans being communicated or actually implemented by companies. Um, do you have any advice for companies and or investors to, uh, so that we can improve that and see more long-term plans out there and you know, more effective long-term plans and have those incorporated into investment analysis? Well, first of all, um, you know, I, my background was in strategy. So it, was, okay. um, I, it grew up in my nature. I was with the Boston Consulting Group early in my career. So building long-term plans was always part of it. So one of the key questions I'd always ask people is, where does your head of strategy report? If the head of strategy, because it's an important uh, role, reports to the finance function, it could end up being more short term. I always wanted the head of strategy to report to me directly because I wanted access. I didn't want it to just be a financial numbers exercise. I wanted to say, how are we going to build the company? How do we look at us versus competitors? And so that was my way, one way of doing that. So I think that my advice to other companies would be to build a strategy function that isn't just the financial. Now, of course, the head of finance, CFO, he always wants CF, the head of strategy reporting to him. Um, and it can't just be an M&A function, too, because it, that's not how you build a company just through M&A. It's a, an important uh, part of that. But my advice would be, as to other CEOs, is to really build the company with a strategic function uh, that really are the keepers of thinking of the different ways to grow the company, but holding everybody on the team accountable for building value. Mm -hmm. So I find the best CEOs really use their operating heads. You know, you don't just get to run the business, you have to think about how you're gonna build it over the long term. Now, of course, there's a strategy group that can help you think about that and how you buy companies or make investments to build the value, but you're the leader of that business, and maybe it's a region, maybe it's a product line, maybe it's global, but you have to have that, you're, you're being held accountable for that. So that accountability um, is very important for, to build the company. I would imagine uh, the incentive structure is also critically important. Absolutely, I mean, most, um, when you read the proxies, and I pour over them in great detail, to make sure that the goals um, uh, that are assigned to the senior leadership are consistent across the leadership. Now, there might be a specific goal for a particular business unit, but in general, whether it's total shareholder return or EVA, um, there's certain uh, metrics that the entire team are being held uh, accountable for. And over, I imagine, a particular time frame to encourage longer-term thinking and not short-termism. Absolutely. I mean, I've never seen a long-term goal less than three years. Um, five years also works in some industries. It depends on which one. But certainly, a three-year um, TSR is very important. So I'd like to pivot a little bit for our last question. Um, you know, it was mentioned that you've been um, the first woman to serve on a number of boards, um, CEO of a major company for a number of years. Um, can you comment a little bit about why you feel that it's been so difficult for women to be appointed as directors of companies or as CEOs, and some of the lessons that you've learned through your experience to uh, you know, where you've been successful in that regard. 
Sure. I mean, I give a lot of advice to people. To people say, you know, well, how can I do this? How can I get on a board? And I say, well, first of all, being analytical is kind of a given in today's world. You have to mm -hmm. understand the analytics. If you don't have it in your background, take a course, meet with people. And so that always helped me um, early on to have that analytical background. But, um, you know, I've actually, uh, one of the things we were talking about is my husband and I have been giving a lot of speeches on dual career couples. Mm -hmm. And um, what is it going to take to be successful long term? And, you know, I've met Sheryl Sandberg who talks about women leaning in and companies being diverse minded. And those, both those things are important. But there's not enough conversation going on in the couples and what has to happen. Uh, and so my husband and I have been giving back by talking to some MBA students and giving him our learnings after 40 years of being married of uh, you know, our 10 rules of learning, which is a lot about communication and treating mm. people well. So I think what it's going to take is, uh, it's going to take all of that. Um, women being analytical, uh, women focused on their careers. And every time I ask my company, could you be a little flexible here? They said, absolutely. I remember once I was asked to move, um, I was working for Pechenet, a French company, and they asked me to move from Chicago to Paris. It sounded great. But, and you have one day to decide. And I said, well, you know what? I need three days. And they gave it to me. So it was, so companies will, will be flexible, but the couples have to be willing to make sacrifices. And when I tell people that, what mm -hmm. that means is, you're not gonna have time um, for a great career and a great family, which I think is very important, and I've been able to raise two wonderful kids with my husband, and we now have two grandkids. But I think that you have to be willing to give up, I don't know, sleep, social life, <laughs> dinner parties. There's a few things that you have to give up, but it's doable. It's just, it just takes a lot of communication by the couple and willingness to do that. So the advice I give to uh, boards about building a diverse slate. First of all, build a diverse slate to start with. Number two, uh, women who have the time and inclination or people of color to go onto boards, I say, you know what? Go to a small, small town. Um, go to an industry where you can add value. This isn't about you just joining. Don't just be a financial wonk. Um, manufacturing companies are in big need. And so go to a company that you can add value that you maybe worked in an adjacent industry and volunteer to go to that small town and you will find wonderful people, great companies that are global in nature, but they happen to be located like International Paper in Memphis, fantastic company. But you have to be willing to, to move it, to do something a little bit out of your comfort zone. And so I think that's my advice is to tell people that you have, you have to be willing to do that. Great, thank you very much. I'm afraid that's all the time we have. So please join me in thanking Eileen. Okay, thank you. Thank you.